Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You told me to speak right into it. My name is Eugene Delgadio. We've been here, some of you, uh, for 17 years. I want to start out with uh, a quick prayer to God, thanking Him for letting us be here for so long and again tonight. Dear God, thank you for the meal we have received. Thank you for letting us be here. Thank you for giving us a glorious Easter and resurrection. Thank you for Sterling. Thank you for Corey Stewart. Amen. Amen. For those of you who don't know, I'm Eugene Delgado. That's my name on the hat. I was supervisor here for uh, 16 years. And it was during that time as a supervisor for 16 years that I met uh, Corey Stewart. And Corey, just let me tell you how historic this location is. There's a gentleman. We always have support here from uh, Joe's Pizza. His name is Fareed. You just met Fareed. Uh, we always salute him at the beginning of an event. Fareed hosts a lot of community events here. So this is more or less Sterling's best for you. And the owner of the restaurant is Fareed. So let's hear it for Reed and for Joe's Pizza. And, and of course, I, I've had at least 100 events here, so... Well, this is where we eat. Um, I think they have a card back there with my name on it. They just charge it. So I want to say tonight we're here for a candidate that I started to know when I was a supervisor. And without, I say this with all sincerity, I have support of the people of Sterling. You know, elections come and go. I was in there for four terms. You know Sterling is a tough place to win. But one of the people who inspired me as supervisor and someone who was critical in saving our community. When I say saving our community, sure, I had the role, the primary role as supervisor, but one of the legislative solutions I would not have had available to me as a supervisor, uh, together with uh, uh, Corey Stewart and John Stirrup, a uh, team in Prince William, they put together a legislative program for their county that you're going to hear about from him, the candidate himself. But I've never really expressed myself publicly for Corey. I'm sure I'm backing him for governor, but let me tell you, when Western civilization in our community were threatened, was threatened with annihilation, there were no tools available to me as a supervisor, and I sure got a good reputation as someone who could get something done. But facing the impossible with no idea how to do it, until I met Corey, until I saw Corey, what he was doing with Prince William County. And today, it's one of the signature accomplishments of his administration and a confidence that I have in him based on directly experiencing the solution to a problem in Prince William, in, in Loudoun, in Herndon. And had he not come forward like that man on the horse in the white outfit, right at the sun, sun, sunset, sunset, sunrise, Right at the sunrise, when the heathens and the troglodytes and the zombies were surrounding us from every direction, and the crime and the shootings, just a block away from here, public shootings in the shopping center, right a block away. Congressmen were just totally without ability. The FBI was shackled. The man came forward, came up with a solution, local government cooperating with federal authorities, Local government cooperating with governor, local uh, local officials encouraging local police. That was Corey Stewart. So I want to say thank you, Corey, for that uh, for that help. Uh, your host committee tonight, besides Fareed, uh, Charlie King, the savior of Loudoun County, who ran for chairman of the board of supervisors. <laughs> Charlie King is kind of like that maverick who shows up at the last minute and uh, rescues you along with a bunch of other people. Uh, it's good to have you as the highest ranking Republican candidate here, chairman candidate, uh, Charlie King. Uh, my daughter, Alicia, is here. She has worked day and night for Charlie. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, another member of our committee, uh, Joe Budzinski probably did 20,000 doors uh, during the period of time from the very beginning. Uh, this is Joe Bedinsky right here. Uh, I
told Corey about Joe. Joe has been uh, named or about to be named momentarily to a uh, represent Loudoun County in the 86th House uh, District. Hope that comes out as, as, as Joe would want it to be. He would represent us to help another person, and I don't know if it's appropriate, but I, I'll let you decide. Uh, but another member of our committee, uh, where, Rich Kunkel? Yes. Not now, but right now, Rich Kunkel is a member of our committee, and he'll have a special announcement when Corey's ready. Okay. <laughs> who, who else did I, did I miss on my committee? Did I miss anybody else on the, on the host committee? I'm sorry. Richard, oh, I'm on the host committee. You got Richard? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm on the host committee. All right. Okay, well, we're now up. You're up. Okay. This is it. All right. Thank you. Well, good evening, Loudoun County. How are y'all doing tonight? So I've got one question for you. Are you ready to take back Virginia? Well, we're going to get it started, and let me tell you something about this guy here. You know, he, he said some nice things, but the truth is that when I got into politics, Eugene had already been fighting the fight for years. And, you know, there's one thing, we don't talk about this very much anymore, but it was talked about a lot, you know, in the early 60s. Uh, JFK would talk about, you know, the one thing that's, that's pivotal in politics the only, thing, the only way you can ever change the world, the only way you can ever change anything, you have to have guts, you got to have courage. And Eugene Delgadio has courage. If any politician's got courage, this guy has it. And I, gotta, I really want to talk to you. I want to thank, uh, thank Charlie as well, uh, and Alicia, especially Alicia, and thank you. You know what, when I found out through your dad, uh, that Alicia was on board, and I'm like, that's it, we're going to win. We're going to win. Not only are we going to win loud, we're going to win the whole darn state. And Joe, the funny thing about Joe here is uh, 10 years ago when I was involved in the uh, uh, Help Save Manassas, and there was Help Save Loud and all those groups, and there were some, back then blogs were the big thing. It wasn't so much Facebook. I don't even know if it was invented back then, but the, the blogs, and uh, Joe would be on the blogs and he'd be saying some nice things about me. And I'd go back to uh, where I worked. I worked at a law firm called Gardner, Carton, and Douglas at the time. And I, there, was a, there was an attorney there named Joe Bozinski. I said, Joe, thanks for logging in. <laughs> and saying all those nice things. I didn't even know you supported my politics. And he goes, well, I don't. <laughs> I said, and then at that one, oh my gosh, there's another Joe Bozinski in the, in, the, in the area. But anyway, so... Ten years later, let me thank you for all your support <laughs> back then. Those are some times. And, uh, and Richard, thank you. Where are you, Richard? Thank you. And uh, I do, I'm going to have Richard come up here and uh, make a special announcement uh, right after I'm done. So we had a debate. How many people saw the debate last Thursday? Yeah. So if you haven't seen it, please do. Because... That shows the differences. You know, there's something, we've seen this over the past several years, people who call themselves conservatives, but they're not. And when they get into office, if they get into office, they never do what they claimed they were going to do. And then there are just so many that now, those kinds of Republicans, and by the way, it's not just the Republican side, it's on the Democratic side too, these are establishment folks. They really aren't for changing anything. They're just trying to get your vote. They really don't want to change anything. And when they get in there, they find an excuse not to do it. Well, we know who the real Ed Gillespie is. And you know how we know who the red, real Ed Gillespie is? In his own words. Now, every time I asked him a question last Thursday, he said, go to Facebook. Google Corey Stewart. He lies. Right? <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. So I said, finally, and I, I had a couple of chances to rebut, you know, and I said, Ed, it's in your book. It's in your book. I said, you supported Obamacare way back when. You said you supported it. And he goes, well, no, no. I, you know, he just said, Corey lies, Corey lies. And I said, Ed, it's on, two, it's on page 245 of your 
book. So is your book a lie, or are you lying now? And here's the other thing, too, and we'll talk about illegal immigration in a moment, but, you know, 10 years ago, it was bad. Especially in Prince William County, we had a series of very grisly, horrible murders committed by illegal aliens who were a member of a gang called MS-13 against young women in our community and young men. And it was that which drove us, and the community came to us, and they asked us to do something as a locality on illegal immigration. And at first, like other localities, we didn't think there was anything that we could do. But we looked into it. And somebody who was on the board of supervisors at the time, John Stirrup, a great man, a great leader, a good friend of, of Eugene's and mine, came up with this program. It was uh, written by the Immigration Reform Law Institute in conjunction with FAIR. Uh, in Washington, and it, it is this policy. If in the course of detaining someone in Prince William County, we, the policy is this, we check immigration status of every single person, every single person who is arrested for a crime, everyone. The inquiry goes by the police officer, and if the police officer, based upon that inquiry, thinks that the person is here illegally, they give that information to the magistrate. The magistrate's like a mini-judge who hears these, uh, makes some decisions late at night when the police officer brings it into the jail. Are you going to be held in jail or are you going to be released? That's one of those decisions that the magistrate makes. If the police officer says, well, look, I believe, based upon my inquiry, that the person is here illegally. The magistrate can use that information to hold the person in jail because there's an increased risk of flight. Once they're in jail, we check with 100% certainty 100% of the inmates for immigration status. And if somebody is here illegally, we initiate the deportation process, and when the person serves their sentence for the underlying crime, we hand them over for deportation. And the crime in this program works so far, we've handed more than 7,500 criminal, illegal aliens over to ICE, and the violent crime rate dropped by 48.7% to Our number one job as elected leaders is to protect you and your families, to protect your lives, to protect your safety, to protect your rights. If we don't get that right, nothing else matters. This is what matters to me in my personal life, is that I protect my family. And before I go on, I did want to introduce my wife, Maria, of 22 years, right back there. So we've had some grisly murders just here in Northern Virginia and in Maryland. And they're horrible. And the thing is, that it makes it especially tragic is that these illegals who are committing these murders have committed previous crimes in Virginia and around the country before. If those illegal aliens had been identified as illegal aliens when they committed those earlier crimes, and if they had been deported after they committed those earlier crimes, they wouldn't be in the country to commit the murders and the rapes and the other brutal crimes that they're committing. And this just happened down in Lynchburg, where a brutal, criminal, illegal, uh, three of them, members of MS-13, abducted an 11th grade boy, 17 years old. They cut off his hands while he was alive. They cut off his feet while he was alive. And then they slit his throat. And then they dumped his body in Bedford. So... This isn't just a problem in Northern Virginia anymore, not just a problem in Hampton Roads, but it's spreading across the entire state. Because illegal aliens know that in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we're not checking immigration status, that you can commit a crime as an illegal alien and you can still stay in the country, and that's just wrong. And when I'm governor of the Commonwealth, we're ending that and we're going to put the toughest crackdown on illegal immigration anywhere in the country, right here in the Commonwealth. 
Now, some say, what is this? This is a tax rally here, an anti tax rally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is tax day. And the income tax. And somebody will say, well, why are you talking about illegal immigration on tax day? Because it affects your taxes. That's why. If you're the child of, of an illegal alien, and by the way, the term is illegal alien. Why? Because an illegal alien is not an immigrant. An immigrant is somebody who comes into the country legally with the intention of staying here. So, when someone comes in here illegally and they have children, all the money that they make is off the books. It's all off the books because they generally don't have social security numbers, they're hired, they're paid money, they're not paying taxes, but on the books, it's zero. There's no money. That means that your children, because your, their parents have no money on the books, are automatically entitled to Medicaid and all the other social welfare programs that the state and the federal governments offer. And it affects the bottom lines, not just the state and the federal governments, but of the localities as well. So when we put this policy into place in Prince William County, it just happens that it coincided with the biggest spending cut in Prince William County history and also the biggest tax cut in Prince William County history. We in Prince William County, like you in Loudoun, were faced with the biggest recession since World War II. The biggest recession since World War II. Housing values in Prince William County were particularly affected. They dropped by 60% in two and a half years. 60%. We had to make a decision. Now, I was blessed because we had more conservatives on our board. Eugene is one of the always strong, but you've never had enough friends on that board to bring it down. But I was blessed to have some good, solid conservatives on the board with me. And in that year, when we could have simply just jacked the rate way, way, way up, to offset the drop in housing values, to make up for the lost revenue, we decided to take a different course. And we cut $185 million out of our budget in a single year. And we dropped the average tax bills in Prince William County by more than $400 in a single year. That had never been done before. All these years later, our tax bills, the average tax bill in Prince William County is 4,100, sorry, the average tax bill in Prince William County in 2016 dollars, when I, in 2009, when I took over as, as chairman, was 4,141 dollars. Today, all these years later, after we've added hundreds of new firefighters, hundreds of new teachers, hundreds of new police officers, spent 300 million dollars of local funding on our, the biggest most robust road building program in the state, $50 million in parks. Average tax bills today are $4,038. They're actually lower today than they were 10 years ago when I took over as the chairman. So how does this all apply to the state? Because there are two tax plans on the table. And if you watch the debate, you'll see it. Ed. Gillespie, I call him Establishment Ed, as you all know, has a tax plan. He says he's going to reduce taxes by 10% over three or four years or something like that. Do you know what he's going to cut in order to bring down tax bills, the tax, the tax rate in Virginia? Does anybody have any guesses? Nothing. He's proposing to reduce taxes without any spending reductions. None. Nada. He thinks that he's going to finance a tax cut based upon unanticipated new revenues. When has that happened last in Virginia? It hasn't happened in 10 years, folks. And even if it happened in one year, you couldn't count on it continued increases in tax and in revenues going forward. You cannot finance a substantial tax cut 
without substantial spending cuts as well. And that is what we have to do in Virginia. Governor Wilder did it. Governor Wilder did it. A Democrat did it. If Governor Wilder could have a 10% spending reduction across the board, all those years ago, as a Democrat, we can certainly do it with a Republican administration in 2017 and 2018 going forward. So what we did, what we did, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than I normally do because this is a tax rally, but it's this. We required every single department to say, to detail spending reductions at the 10% level, the 20% level, and the 30% level. Say something catastrophic happened and the department had to make cuts. They couldn't be fake cuts. They couldn't, and if we called it on it and we chose that cut, that had to be real. And every department had to do it. Now, if you're a department head and you have to cut 10, 20, or 30% off of your budget, where do you go to make to identify those cuts? You go to your mid-level managers. And the mid-level managers have to identify cuts. And the mid-level managers then push those decisions, that cost savings uh, search, deeper into the bureaucracy so that you have every member of the Prince William County government looking for savings. And that is how we cut $185 million in spending. And that is what we've got to do in the Commonwealth. The governor's office, specifically me as governor, will be, detract, will be directing all of the department heads to identify cuts at those levels. And then when those are identified, we're going to select the cuts that will serve the Commonwealth best. And then we're going to reduce spending. We don't even have to do it, folks, by 10%. We've got to reduce the general fund by 10%. For the all funds budget, we got to reduce by 5% overall, and by doing that, we are going to be able in a single year to drop the tax rate, the highest marginal income tax rate in the state, from 5.75% to 4.75% for the biggest tax cut ever in Virginia history. And why is this important? It's not just important because it's important to you as citizens, but it's also important because we're losing jobs in Virginia. We're lo losing approximately 10,000 manufacturing jobs per year in the Commonwealth. 10,000. And you know where they're going? They're going to other states primarily, like North Carolina. North Carolina is eating our lunch. They're eating our lunch. Why? Because their top marginal income tax rate in 2010, seven years ago, think about this, seven years ago, was 7.75%. They've been ratcheting it down. And today, as of January 1st, the top marginal income tax rate in North Carolina is 5.49%. And guess where the jobs are going? They're going to North Carolina. It's got a better tax environment for business. It's got a better business environment overall, and that's why their gain is our loss. And when we take our marginal, top marginal income tax rate from 5.75% to 4.75% in a single year with plans to reduce them even further with the eventual phase out of the income tax in Virginia, Guess where the jobs are going to be flowing? They're going to be flowing from North Carolina and other states and Maryland into the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we're going to have the biggest job growth anywhere in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. There are a lot of other issues. I did want to stay and focus on taxes today, but I want to let you know something, and that is this. No one knows for certain, no one knows for certain what obstacles, what challenges the governor of Virginia is going to have to face in the next four years. And that is why you have to choose your nominee and you've got to choose your governor based upon their character. And if you're looking for somebody who's willing to fight, and if you're looking for somebody who's willing to challenge the left-wing press, to challenge the left wing, 
to challenge establishment Republicans. If you're looking for somebody who's not afraid of controversy, and if you're looking for somebody who knows how to win, then I am your candidate for governor, and I let's take back Virginia. Next and now I'll be taking any questions. Matt, do you want to stop? Okay. Questions.